Without trust, relationships are stuck. You can't move forward because you subconsciously don't feel supported. In today's episode, we're going to explore how to build trust and how to get it back. And the answers to these questions will likely surprise you. Our promise to you has always been that we would share real experiences and sometimes our struggles to help you overcome obstacles that you might be facing in your relationship right now. Today, we're going to talk about something that's pretty deep and we hope to be thought provoking and cause you to look within and create positive change in your own relationship. And as you listen, I want you to think about how this problem that we encountered wasn't an insurmountable obstacle for us. It was just one of those universal problems that presents itself differently in just about every relationship. And you've likely seen a version of it in your relationship as well. I think we all have versions of this problem in in our relationship. But so a little while ago, a number of years ago, I was I was privileged to see Brene Brown speak at a at a conference, and I wanted. To, and so, of course, I researched a little bit more about her, and I wanted to start with a Brene Brown story that I really heard that struck me. This story has caused a lot of conversations between Cheryl and I about men, and about vulnerability and trust, which is at the at the heart of this matter. In 2014, author and researcher Brene Brown gave a TED Talk titled listening to shame. I recommend that you look for that. In this talk, she told the story of a man who came up to her at one of her book signings. And he said, you know, I really like everything that you said, but uh, you didn't mention men. Brene says, well, I don't study men. The man man replied as he looked at her and he said, well, that's convenient. (laughs) Why? Brene asked him. The man continued, we all have shame. We have deep shame. But when we reach out and we tell our stories, we get the emotional crap kicked out of us. And it's not just from the guys. The women in my life are harder on me than anyone else. Then he said, do you see those three girls over there with my wife? You just signed books for them? She's like, yes. He said, yeah, they would rather see me die on top of my white horse than ever watch me fall down. Oof. Oof. That hit hard. This story, when Robert shared it with me, he, he came and he's like, Charlotte, Charlotte, you've got to watch this TED Talk. And the story really profoundly impacted both of us. And it caused us to really wonder, do women really only respect their men when they're playing the hero? When he struggles or when he falls off that proverbial white horse, is our instinct really to abandon him? or to kick him when he's down? Or can he trust us to have his back and to help him back up? And as I think of it, I actually get a little bit sad because some I, I realize that in some ways I have played a part in this, that I have perpetuated this problem in the past. And I know that I'm not alone in that because in one of our most viral TikToks, I shared in a video that as women, we need to do a better job of providing a safe place for our men to be able to share their emotions and to be able to share their vulnerabilities. E, that was rough. And it was rough. And the comments that I that I got on that video seriously highlighted the very problem that I was trying to expose. Dozens upon dozens, maybe hundreds of men, mostly men, said, you know, we just don't feel safe being vulnerable with our partner. And we want to share a few of these comments with you right now just to kind of paint a picture and, and, and help you to kind of see what we're talking about. Okay, so these are multiple comments, multiple men. So one man said, absolutely hide your emotions. If you don't, you will be beaten down. Another, when we don't hide them, it's used against us every single time. One more, too many of us men have been burned by showing emotions to women who weaponize them. As soon as a man shows respect, weakness, or vulnerability, trust me, she will lose respect for you. Yeah. Interesting comments. And clearly, it's a pattern. On on Psych Info, which is the database that psychologists use to do literature review, there are over 100,000 references to trust. 
And it seems when social psychologists are asking people in relationships, hey, what's the most desirable quality that you're looking for in a partner? Trustworthiness is number one. It's not being physically attractive. It's not being rich. It's not being funny. I mean, I've got a couple of those qualities. <laughs> no, actually... The quality they look for most is to be able to totally trust someone. That's what people want. First step to having connection, intimacy, and friendship is trust. That is the foundation of any relationship. This is why trust is also the first pillar in our coaching method. Without trust, relationships are stuck. You can't move forward because subconsciously, you don't feel supported. Right. So let's dig deeper into trust. And now you might be thinking to yourself something like, hey, well, of course I trust my partner. Or maybe you're thinking my partner would never cheat on me. But before you skip ahead thinking you may not need it, let me stop you and, and say that betrayal is not entirely related to distrust. They're actually different things. In other words, trust is not just the absence of cheating. So if trust is not the absence of cheating, then what is trust? And while you may say that you trust your partner, do you actually even know what the basis is for that trust? Do you trust your partner because that trust hasn't been tested yet? Do you know what behaviors actually increase trust? Do you know what behaviors erode trust? Okay. All right, this sounds a lot more interesting. Let's just start with a sort of a broad-based definition of trust. Trust is the state that occurs when you know your partner acts and thinks to maximize your best interests, not just their own. In other words, my partner has my back and they are there for me. Likewise, if I act and think of Charlotte's best interests, I have her back. And while this is true, it's also a very broad definition and to really understand all of the different nuances of trust. So we wanted to share a couple of personal stories. These are a little rough. To illustrate how trust is earned, lost, and built in the day-to-day -day choices that we make. Okay, so time to get vulnerable. Oof. Since we're talking about vulnerability. <laughs> so just like those TikTok comments that we just shared with you, I haven't always provided a safe space for Robert to be able to share his feelings and his vulnerabilities. So, you know, growing up, my parents fought pretty intensely. It seemed like, at least in my memory, it seems like it was every day. And most of those were pretty, pretty intense. I never witnessed a compromise. I never heard, I'm sorry. I didn't know that conflict conversations could actually be positive or loving. Like that concept alone was so foreign to me that it may as well have been rocket science. The only type of conflict I was familiar with was yelling and criticizing and contempt. And because this was my experience, I really didn't know what constructive conflict looked like and how to do it as an adult. I didn't know what that would look like. And if Robert had a different viewpoint on something, it was extremely unsettling for me. I also didn't know how to express my feelings very well or my needs. And I think it really just boils down to the fact that deep down, I probably didn't trust or feel worthy of my own feelings. And because I didn't trust my own feelings, I was really uncomfortable with other people's feelings. And, you know, I guess what I was really doing is I wasn't giving myself permission to have emotions too much. And because of that, I certainly wasn't going to give Robert permission to have emotions either. And this is what led to a time when I hurt him pretty bad. And for years, it affected our relationship and it, and it hurt us. And so you share that part. <laughs> oh, it's just tough even hearing you say it that way. You know, I mean, from the outside, I think people saw that in you. They saw, they thought that you were closed off. But from the insider perspective, I knew that you had feelings and emotion. It just, I knew that you struggled with them a little bit. I didn't, certainly at the time, didn't, didn't know what to do about it or, right. or how to do anything about it. So I remember this one time we were having a discussion. I don't remember what that discussion was about, but I said, I said something to the effect of, 
when, when you say that, or when you do that, you know, it really hurts my feelings. Like my feelings are hurt, something like that. And I think that's about as far as I was willing to go was just say the word feelings. <laughs> um, and, and Sharla was a little bit mad and I don't know. Why don't you tell him what you said? This is, this is the hard part. Yeah, this is you. I, I think I said something like, I don't care. Your feelings don't matter. And I don't care about your feelings. Ooh. Yeah. That was a tough one. And, you know, that damaged a lot of trust in our relationship. And so much so that I just sort of, I withdrew a little bit, at least when it comes to the trust part and my armor went up and I felt like, you know, it just, it reinforced all of those stories that, that we hear. And even some of the ones that, that I mentioned earlier from the video, like don't share your feelings, don't get vulnerable. So I just, I stopped doing that. And as a result, I was, I was much less of a dad and I was much less of a husband. Hmm. So what we're saying is that eroded trust in our relationship and it conditioned him to keep his thoughts and his feelings to himself for quite a long time. So trust is much more than just trusting that your partner won't cheat. It's, can I trust you with my feelings and emotions? Can I trust you with my worries and fears? Can I trust that you will take care of the most vulnerable parts of me and not use them against me later? Can I trust that if I allow you to see my weaknesses, you won't exploit them? Mm -hmm. It's also, can I trust you with our differences of opinion? As I said earlier, that was a real struggle for me. Can I trust you that you'll be there and that you'll listen when I'm upset about something? Can I trust you to choose me over someone else, your friends, your mother? Can I trust you to respect me? Can I trust you to help me when I struggle? So as it turns out, it's more about feeling emotionally safe with our partner, which is exactly what allows for deeper connection, friendship, and intimacy that we so, so long for. So how do we build trust? The great thing is we can turn to the research to help us understand what builds trust and what erodes trust. As it turns out, trust is built in very small moments, which John Gottman, noted marriage researcher, calls the sliding door moments. He calls them sliding door moments because they're brief moments where these opportunities for connection and trust are built, but those opportunities open and close as fast as a sliding door. We have to quickly decide whether or not we want to seize these opportunities or not. Right. You see, in any interaction, there's an opportunity to either move toward or away from that connection. So let me share a story, an example from our own relationship a little bit later on from that first story that we shared. So this was actually more recently, and I was working on finishing a manual that I was writing for a course that we were doing. And I had a hard deadline that I needed to get this manual ready for printing because that deadline was quickly approaching. And, and so I had slated the entire day to do nothing else except for put my nose in the laptop and just grind out this project. And I was sitting there in my chair and I noticed Robert appears in the doorway. And I sensed that something, he was feeling something, right? We have to have that awareness of our partner's emotions. And so I, I sensed there was something going on with him. Maybe he was feeling a little bit lonely or disconnected because I'd been focusing on this project for a couple of days and probably ignoring him. And, and I looked up from my computer and he said, hey, honey, I'm, I'm going to Home Depot. Do you want to come with me? That was a, that's sort of a, I don't know, I want to say it's a bold move, move, move for me. But, but when we think about those moments, I just, I knew that she was busy and I was going to go to Home Depot. I had, actually, I don't even know what I was going to buy. I think I was just going to get out of the house and go shop for tools or something. And, but, but I thought I should invite her. I mean, I, I didn't really know, but she said yes. And we call that a bid for connection, right? He's bidding or making an attempt to connect with me. And those are important. So my, in while my immediate thought was no way I need to stay here and I need to finish this project. And if I don't, I'm never going to get it done in time. I also, at the same time, still have that awareness. Like this was an attempt or bid for connection. And there's something he needs. Like emotionally, I could sense it. And there's something he needed from me. 
So I closed my laptop and I hopped into the truck with him and we had a really super great morning together. We spent the next couple of hours talking and connecting and he shared some things that were going on at work. And we were able to talk through some stressful things that we had coming up in our lives. And we actually ended up grabbing breakfast together. And then we got pedicures while we were out and about. Yes, you heard that right. Yeah, yeah. he's real men get pedicures. I went and got a pedicure. Yep. And and still, I was still able to, you know, obviously get my project done later. But the thing is, and here's the point, in that moment, I was building trust. So life is full of these rare opportunities where the sliding door moment, where the door was literally open for maybe four seconds. Like I invited her to go Home Depot and I was really just turning around to walk away when she said yes. But by saying yes, what an amazing experience. And our trust was strengthened. Because I was there for him. Our connection was deepened. And this one moment didn't necessarily make or break our relationship. But here's the thing. If you're always choosing to focus on yourself and ignore the opportunity, trust will begin to erode. We recognize, we recognize the things are, we're, that we're suggesting require some vulnerability and that isn't always easy in our culture. Men are faced with a heavy contradiction when it comes to vulnerability. Yeah, I want to talk about that for a minute, actually. There is this contradiction that men have, and women have various contradictory situations like this as well. But here's the thing, as women, we want our men to be heroes. We want them to be strong. We want them to protect us. We want them to provide for us. And we put them up on these pedestals. But women also want men to be emotional. And that in itself contradicts or it seems as though it contradicts this image of a hero. Women will say things like, you know, I want you to be open with me. But then when the man does, the woman oftentimes will reject or withdraw or judge secretly their man for doing so. And inevitably, this betrays that trust that you were building, which means turning away from your emotional connection. Right. And so respectfully, as a woman, I really want to encourage and to invite women everywhere that we can do better. We can all do better. And trust is at stake. Our heroes, they have feelings too. And if your man comes to you and he shares his emotions with you, tell him and let him know that you respect him and you appreciate him and the courage that it took for him to be able to do that. And, and also stop, be careful, like with your, with your boys too, like your children and your sons, like stop using words like man up because man up really means shut up and repress your feelings. So trust requires us to be vulnerable, yet being vulnerable requires trust. Vulnerability, in fact, is not weakness. Vulnerability is a strength. The myth that being vulnerable, vulnerable is being weak is incredibly dangerous to a relationship, and we need to break that cycle. Yeah. Our relationships depend on it. Of course, this goes both ways for men and women or any person in a relationship. Now, I love this quote. Brene Brown said, show me a woman who can actually sit with a man in real vulnerability and fear, and I will show you a woman who has done incredible work. And show me a man who can sit with a woman who has just had it with her day and she just can't go on and do anymore, where that man really sits and just listens. And I will show you a man who has done incredible work. So you might be wondering what we did to overcome that first regrettable incident where Charlotte told me my feelings didn't matter. Well, for a long time, I was not able or didn't really feel safe enough to share my feelings in vulnerability with Sharla. But with practice, day by day, we built up the trust through small and simple actions. I can tell you that being vulnerable is still tough for me. But when Sharla allows me or really even asks me to share my struggles with her, it creates a closeness and a connection like I've never felt before. Where there's trust, there's connection. Where there's connection, there's oneness. I love that. 
So a couple of key points that we want to make before we wrap up this show. First, trust is about feeling emotionally safe with our partner. That's what trust is. Trust is built through small moments and choices and a lifetime of choices. Trust requires an awareness of our partner's feelings and emotions. It requires vulnerability and tolerance and empathy. So here's our challenge for this episode. For those of you who've made it this far, we're going to drop a download called Trust Through Attunement Blueprint in the show notes for you. We invite you to grab it and have a conversation with your partner about this episode and then recommit with one another to creating a safe space for emotional vulnerability where you both are appreciated and respected for it. And then join us on the next episode of Master Your Marriage. Until next time.